Uh, hello and welcome to the Coed Foundation's Compassionate Comics Project. The Coed Foundation was founded in 2012 to help all institutions bring compassion into education and learning. We were fortunate enough uh, recently to win a bid from uh, Awards for All to run a Compassionate Comics project. What we did was to get 20 students from one of Birmingham City's primary schools, which happened to be predominantly Muslim, to work with 15 students from another primary school in Birmingham, which happened to be predominantly Sikh. Uh, they worked discreetly uh, and then together on a project over the pe period of five or six weeks. All the materials we produced, the lesson plans, uh, the videos are available online. And every, anybody who wants to can actually use them because that was the whole point of running the project. It was a learning curve. It was, for those involved, uh, a wonderful experience. Um, and there are a number of key players. Uh, the, the woman who conceived the project um, is a, a, a storybook children's editor called Fiona Scope. Uh, I supported, uh, we had two filmmakers with us and in a minute I'll introduce our, our uh, artist Gilroy Brown. Um, we managed to finish up with a number of products. Um, for example, all the children who worked in groups used the storyboarding and then the drawing techniques that um, Gilroy had taught them to do their own particular comics and we brought all the children together at Nishkam school which is a Sikh school or predominantly Sikh school and they went round the temple together and they worked on some comics together. When they did their evaluations in relation to compassion and other things they were so moving and so clear in their understanding of the world they wanted based upon compassionate principles that we in fact uh, took a much of their language and have devised our own, uh, it's called Compassion 5, our own um, comic which has been uh, um, uh, written by, by me and then produced by Deco Comics um, and put together by a young lady called Amy Johnson who is only 13 years old. So today we thought what we would do, rather than uh, do a script based upon how to draw, would be to interview um, the amazing artist uh, and I will ask him a number of questions and he will actually take us through the processes um, that the children involved in the project used. Interestingly enough, in the final evaluations, the thing that the children liked most was actually doing the drawing and the thing they wanted to develop more was their drawing skills. So, the aim will be to take you through that with the assistance of one Mr. Gilroy Brown. Gilroy, who has been my friend Hello. since morning. Since morning. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, he was the star of the show. Gilroy um, is part of the foundation. He's one of the trustees and advisory board, one of our consultants. He was a head teacher for a number of years and an advisory teacher and an advisor um, and a great community man. So, Gil, welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm going to step back, ask the questions, and Gilroy is going to teach anybody who can't draw how to draw. So, what are you hoping to do what, today? Well, I'm hope, what I'm hoping to do today is to show that everyone can draw, and everyone is an artist, and everyone's been born with the power to be creative. We're naturally born with the desire to be explorative, expressive, and that's part of the creative process. So hopefully today we can show how that can be brought about. And in many schools, sadly, children are prevented unwittingly from exploring to the extent that they should do and being expressive to the extent that they should be. Right. Yeah, so how does one start then? How does one begin? Well, the important thing is to develop that artist's eye. And for an artist, three key things need to be established. And this is what I learned as I was developing as an artist. One, that you draw what you see, and two, uh, that you look at whatever the subject is in terms of lines and shapes. That way you demystify and deconstruct 
that complex image that we see in front of us and actually turn it into something that's manageable to recreate. And the third one, Yes. the third one, you spoke about scaffolding. Scaffolding is very, very important and I'll demonstrate that as I go through the process of drawing different um, figures to show how the scaffolding actually puts the final piece together. It has to be piece by piece in a particular order. So what you're saying really is that those three artistic principles mm -hmm. are the golden thread Absolutely. through which you weave and you can take even people that can't draw, like right. old me. It is a golden thread because what, what it's actually showing is showing you that all people can draw, everyone can draw. It's just remembering those key principles. And we've proven it time and time again with many children with some amazing results. Children who said from the age of seven they cannot draw, and within a couple of hours their drawing has improved tremendously. The progress is fantastic. From pictures or from initial drawings that are unrecognisable to masterpieces. Uh, work that um, the finished result, you'd think the children were much older than they are. When we ran the project, you started with portraits. So tell us how you do it. How do you draw oh, Okay, oh, I, I love portraits and I love uh, figurative um, work. That's, that's what interests me. The human face is one of the most interesting things that wherever it was ever created. And if I look at you for a long time, Morris, it's because I'm looking at the interesting features of your face, nothing more than that. <laughs> but with portraits, yes, there's, um, regardless of uh, how one, the, the shape of one's face, be it a, a broad face, a, a slim face, fat face, thin face, uh, old face, young face, whatever, there are some key elements to a face that are the same. We all have two eyes, one nose, one mouth, two ears. And what I'm going to demonstrate this today is how we actually draw a portrait through roughly seven stages using a scaffolding technique. Shall I start? Please. Okay, well first and foremost, we start with drawing an egg shape, not a circle. And the egg shape is important because it's wider at the top and narrower at the bottom. So obviously the widest part would be where the forehead is and the narrow part is where the chin is. And children straight away see that. They think, oh yes, I've been drawing circles all the time and the face is not actually circular. It's more oval shaped or like an egg shape. Once the egg shape is actually drawn, we then put together guidelines and these are the scaffolds in many ways. There's a vertical one that runs straight down the middle. I'm drawing that very light at the moment. Light because if there's a mistake I can rub it out or I can draw over it in the end. So one that goes right through the middle of the face, a vertical um, guideline. Also, the face is symmetrical, which means that if it, it's the same on both sides. It's almost like a, um, left and right are like mirror reflections of each other. A third of the way down, you draw your first horizontal guideline. A third of the way down, I have to stand on this side. Being left-handed has its um, challenges. About a third of the way down, We'll call that number one. We'll call this guideline zero, number one. A third of the way down, we put our first horizontal guideline. Two thirds of the way down, we draw another one. We'll call this number two. And then halfway between the second guideline and the chin, roughly, we draw another horizontal line. We'll call that number three. Now these lines are important because that's, these lines are where we place the features on the face. The eyes, the nose, the mouth. Line one, it's where we'd actually draw the eye. And this line provides a, a very good guide for the upper arch of the eye and the lower arch. And so it's drawn like a lemon shape. Now it's extremely difficult to draw standing up. Standing over the picture would be easier, but I'm hoping that the image will come through in a recognisable way. And again, the eye is roughly one-fifth of the width of the face, roughly one-fifth of the width of the face, and that applies to any face. So we have the, the eye there, drawn almost like a lemon shape. This dividing line also serves another purpose, which I'll illustrate later on. Now we come to the nose. 
This part here, the, the, the very end of the notes, is known as the proboscis, and the children love repeating that word, proboscis, um, is actually placed right there where the two lines join, line zero and line two. And as I said before, that uh, drawing, uh, any form of drawing requires looking at the subject as lines and shapes. Just by a series of lines and shapes, we'll see how the nose actually comes to life. The proboscis is a curved line, an upside down curved line, that meets those two points. So if you were to put a magnifying glass over that area, this is it enlarged, the proboscis is that, is a shape like that. A curved line that meets the two guidelines, zero and two. Now we need to have the nostrils. These are just two shapes, seed shapes if you want to call it, on either side of the proboscis there. And then two other lines, top of the nostrils, and then two further lines to uh, show the bridge of the nose. One on that side of the vertical guideline and one on this side. So straight away, just through those shapes, those lines, we have the nose. Some of the children now realise that this line divides the upper lip from the lower lip. Not to place the lip on top of the line, but to divide both halves. So the upper lip goes above line three, the lower lip below line three. Another thing that I give them, a bit of advice to give them in order to gauge the size of the lips, is to think of the eye, our mouths, the width of our mouth, if you, you could draw a line, a vertical line, straight from the end of the mouth through the centre of the eye. So that gives a, a, a very useful gauge as to the width of the mouth. Now some people have small mouths and wide mouths, you'll have exceptions to the rule, but on the whole, the human face, because it's, it's quite symmetrical, um, you'll find that in most cases the width of the mouth corresponds with the, with the position of the middle of the eye, the pupil of the eye. Like that, like that. At this point, uh, many of the children begin to realise that you've got different shapes within the human face. That from the centre of the eye, or the pupil, down to where the end of the mouth is, and either side, if you were to draw lines joining all of these points, you create a rectangle. Similarly, if you were to join, draw a line that join the points of the two centers of the eye, which is the pupil, to the end of the nose, which is the proboscis, you'd end up drawing an equilateral triangle. That's how symmetrical our face, the human face is. Now, coming back to line three, as you said, above the line, is the upper lip and the upper lip now that we we, we've, we know what the, the know what the width is of the mouth you can start from this point we go up slightly a little dip and down and at this point I get children to put their fingers to the top of the lip and we'll find that all children all people have a slight indentation at the top of the lip the mandible right there and this is a good where getting children to see that, that even though faces are different, we have a lot in common. Uh, we're all basically human beings, and it's a good way to get the message across about the fact that we're all one race, the human race. It's a very uh, a positive, interesting way of dealing with diversity, as uh, looking at the commonality within diversity. And it really generates a lot of interesting conversations with the children uh, about that. Now, as you said before, the uh, below line three we have the lower lip. Now the lower lip is obviously a slightly different shape. Even though some lips may have a slight uh, difference there, but generally speaking that's how it is. Now I have a tendency to draw rather full features. I wonder why that is. Obviously because of my ethnic background, 
my vision of self would be based on my own ethnic features. But similarly, you could draw lips that was slimmer and a nose that was fuller, longer, shorter, however. By the ears. Now the ears come between lines one and two, here and here. And what I often do with the children is I ask them to imagine that their fingers, the tip of their index finger and their thumb, is a pencil. And you're drawing a magic line from the side of your eye, here, line one, and the end of your nose, line two. And I ask them to draw their fingers along the side of their faces, either left or right, and see where the fingers stop. And invariably, the fingers end at the ears. One for the top of the ear, one for the bottom of the ear. That way, there's no mistake as to where the ears should be positioned. It's not going to be up there, and it's certainly not going to be down there. Between one and two, as so. Now, just before we come to the neck, we'll go back to the eyes. If you remember, I, I talked about line one having another purpose. Not only to divide the upper and lower arch of the eye, but line one, this horizontal line here, also serves as a guideline for drawing the eyelids. Um, I often speak to the children about, you know, trying not to draw the face of uh, using a cartoon technique, which is a circle, which I've already said, obviously, that doesn't naturally represent the face. Those, I also get them to realize that eyes aren't actually like this either. And we all know that, but because many of us believe we can't draw, we go for the, what, is the e, what is perceived to be the easier option. But there is a way. This line helps. Straight away, that line becomes the eyelid. It might look as if the person's sleepy at the moment, but they're not, because it depends on, on how you position the iris and the pupil. But straight away you got the eyelids there, and the children say, Ah, oh, right, I see it now. And again, corresponding line, pupil. Now at this point we have a fascinating talk about science, because I asked them, that, what is that? And they say, well, that's a dot in your eye. Or some, some children say, well, that's a pupil. I say, okay, yes, that's right, it's a pupil. But what is it? Is it a dot? Most children will say yes, but some children say, no, sir, I think we heard somewhere that it's a hole. And then the rest of the children say, what hole? A hole in your eye? And then I begin to explain to them the purpose of the pupil, how it allows light in to the back of the eye, hits the screen at the back of the eye, goes to the optic nerve, goes to the brain, and creates the images that we see. Now, coming to the eyebrows, eye lines, I often say, well, the eyebrows aren't actually like that, but we can use those lines as a guide. The eyebrows are lots of tiny hairs growing in the same direction. So again, using the guideline, we can simply do that. Normally, you've got eyebrows. Eyelashes, not like that. This is a typical cartoon doll type face. And more like this. So just those little lines make all the difference. And all I've done really is looked at the face as lines and shapes. Now the neck. I often say to the children, use your finger again put it to the side of your neck and move it upwards. Where does it finish? Under the ears. Now, before, at this point now, they're, they're, they're dying to get, to draw their neck. And I said, no, stop, 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 because if you're not careful, you'll end up doing it like that, because after all, it comes under the ears. What you have to do is, under the ears, close to the face, out. Under the ears, close to the face, out. In fact, it starts coming out from line three. There. And there we have the face portrait. Now, again with hair, if the person has uh, straight hair or wavy hair, European hair, lots of lines going in the same direction, following. 
So as you can see, after a while you get the impression of hair. And if you draw lines closer together, thicker hair. Could be male, could be female. Depending. And at this time now, I allow the children to be as creative as they want to be. Either make it a male or a female, old, young, glasses, beard, whatever. Bearing in mind that the children will be from diverse backgrounds, what if the person has curly hair? Draw the hairline, and again, a series of tight curls. Again, just these small, tight, circular shapes creates the impression of tightly curled hair. And that's closely cropped, tightly curled hair. But it could also be a half row as well. So you can make that half row as big as you want. The curls as big or as small as you need. Because again with afro hair you've got different textured afro, afro hair. From very tight curls to very loose curls. And then some interesting features on like worry lines in the forehead and I often say to the children well you haven't got those at the moment but you soon will but look at mine you'll see that I've traveled many miles <laughs> dimple in the chin chisel cheekbones that's the wall shirt collar again finger now this is going beyond the portrait we realize but of course with, if you draw a head you want to draw a neck you want to draw a neck you want to draw a collar I tell them to put their finger at the back of their neck and draw and feel along the collar of their shirt or jumper. I ask them what shape are they drawing? They say, well, you're drawing a curved line. So that's all right. The same principle applies when you're drawing a collar. Curved line. Curved line. And if the subject happens to be in a shirt and tie, Again, look at the lines and the shapes. Lines. That's, that's essentially what it is. The portrait. Thank you. Before you turn it over, girl, there's a lovely lesson on sort of crime watch here. Isn't yes, there? yes, yes. Where you could do this. I, <laughs> are, when, when teachers are planning stuff, are they able to do um, the lines for the pupils in advance so that you've got yes. something to Yeah, that, that, that helps. That certainly helps. When, when, when I do it, I actually um, very lightly draw the egg shape for them and the, the guidelines because they'll see that as being a very difficult first step. So I give them that yeah. and I then ask them to build on it. So um, I'll actually be modeling it and they'll be drawing it as I draw it. Brilliant. Then what I then do after that is then say, okay, then you've done the first one. And by this time, their confidence has actually risen tremendously. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, then the next one, I'll just draw the egg shape. You draw the guidelines in. And then sometimes you have to differentiate it. Um, some chicken says, oh, I still don't know what to do, sir. So I'll draw the egg shape and the vertical guideline and say right think of the, the other guidelines I remember what we said this is a third of the way down so think about it separate into, into three thirds so they're going to use their mathematical yeah. understanding yeah, yeah. Uh, for, the, for the profile yeah, you have the same principles if I was to uh, illustrate down here we said we had the um, portrait which was an egg shape guidelines almost right the profile is an egg shape, but tilted, and the same lines come through, roughly. Now, I'll draw one here. Oh, I'll just for you to see. So it's the egg shape, but at an angle. That vertical line at an angle. We, we won't be using a central vertical guideline this time. Okay, 
However, what we will be doing is using the same guidelines, horizontal guidelines that we use for the portrait and in the same position. So line one will still come a third of the way down. Line two will still come roughly two thirds of the way down. And line three, as we said before, would be halfway between line two and where the chin is supposed to be, so roughly here. One, two, three. Right. Now, as we said before, line one uh, was for the eyes. The, to, uh, and in the case of the portrait, it was to, um, to divide or to separate the upper arch from the lower arch. From the side then, that line would go directly through the eye socket. There. And then a line following the bridge of the nose would end up at line two. So the side of the face, the dip in there, that's where the eye is, to the nose. Yeah. Just under line two, that's the nose there. It dips in again. And I often say to the children, use your finger as a magic pencil, follow the shape of your face or the outline of your face, you'll see it dips in there. So each child is actually um, following the same process physically with their fingers around their face so they can see it. Goes in, out, in, in there because that line divides the upper lip from the lower lip. So look at it from the side, this side, look, and then you've got the chin. Okay, that's roughly it. Roughly, there it goes. Now remember we talked about um, drawing any subject, you're going to look at it in terms of lines and shapes. I learnt a lot from uh, comic drawings. I read a lot of Spider-Man and Superman as a child and literally copied the artist's techniques as to how they do their figures, faces, etc. I was fascinated by how they drew the eye from the side, the profile. And they draw the eye just using these three lines. Now, out of the face, it looks rather weird. But I'll put it in the face in a moment. Literally that. Three lines. Right here. Eyelash, the bottom of the eyelid, the lower eyelid, the eye in there. The nose. Remember that, that sort of seed shape for the nostril there? It's a, it's a similar shape when looking at the face from the side. Now some children will say, but sir, uh, aren't there two nostrils? Should you put another one there? And some kids have actually got it. They say, hold on a minute, but remember what sir said? You draw what you see. We know it's there somewhere, but it's not on this side of the face. Similarly, I remember one child tried to draw an ear out there and all the children were laughing and I said, do you get it now? He says, yeah, I do. Yeah, it's around the other side, you can't see it. Right. Eyebrows, guideline, lots of tiny hairs going in the same direction. There you are. The lips, I'll just give you a bit of a feature there. Now, I mean, a big challenge for the children uh, when coming to this stage is, where do you put the ears? And uh, I have a bit of fun with the children because I call about half a dozen children out one after the other. Say, well, so where would the ears be? Now some children say, well, it's gotta be between lines one and two. That's right, yeah. Okay, but how far back or how far forward should the ears be? And some children say, well, it should be in the middle, sir. I say, okay, well, come up and show me. And they'll go like this. Yeah. But well, one or two get it right in the end, the ears. The ears. We're roughly about there. And the position of the ears helps because if you're going to draw the neck from the side, follow again the ear to the throat. The ear roughly is aligned to the throat, which is about there. 
What about the where, where does, the, where does the, uh, the, uh, the back of the neck go? Now this is a, a bit of a difficult one this one. I often say to the children, right, go back to line one, go in and then out. Almost at line two. I, I try not to say go straight into line two because sometimes we'll go in too far and make the neck look too thin. Okay? Because remember that the whole purpose of the neck is to support the head. So it's got to be thick enough, wide enough to fit the head. But that's roughly it. Now, if I was to revise this, I'd probably bring this neck out a bit more like that. And probably bring the, the ears a bit forward. But that essentially is what, it's, what it is. Um, and for the hair, or if you're someone with straight hair, or wavy hair, either way, it will. Then the children then can put the details of the ears in, and some people with an earring there, someone might draw a beard there, whatever. And again, you know, you, you'll find they'll, they'll do the beard and they'll draw the beard right up to that line. And I say, no, that's just, that that's just, was just to help you to draw the shape of the head. You do have a jaw that goes there. So therefore, the beard should come and should follow the line of the jaw. How many things you can do? As I said before, very difficult drawing standing up and standing to the side as well here. Um, but you get the idea. Now, Morris, I don't know, does that look like a, a profile to you? I think it does. <laughs> yes, yes. It's another, okay. it's another um, photo fit, isn't it? Have you uh, seen this Absolutely. And there's, <laughs> uh, there's so much more you can do. If you want to, you can make the head slightly bigger if you want to, or place more hair on the head to sort of increase the volume of the head, so forth. And of course, it can be either male, female, black or white, whichever you choose. How do you apply your principles to um, the drawing of figures? Ah, uh, figures, very challenging. And of course, uh, that's what we had to focus on when we did the Compassionate Comics sessions, uh, drawing figures. Because if, if we're talking about action, then you've got, to, you've, got to, you've got to think of bodies that are moving or, or in positions of, uh, that would suggest movement. Okay, but before we do that, we have to start off with the body itself. Now. Many children, and I often say to children, well, we're going to start off by drawing stick people. And they go, oh, that's a relief. I say, yes, but there's still some challenges there. And I say to them, all right, the, uh, the, the, the classic stick man is obviously this type of guy. I'm showing my age here. Do you remember Simon Templer? Uh, of, course. of course. The same. I'm older. Of course. Right. Okay, that's how he was drawn. <laughs> we can start with the stick man, but, then, but we're gonna, obviously going to upgrade this stick man. Now I said to the children, right, the stick man I'm going to show you is going to be drawn this way. Start off with uh, the egg shape for the head. So straight away, it's not a circle. And then I, I do this, I draw that line. And then I do this. And it confuses the kids. They say, well, hold on, sir, wait a minute. What is that? So what, you tell me. Ah, I know what it is. It's, it's the arms. So, okay. Uh, I'm going to draw uh, uh, a dot there and a dot there. What's that? Oh, those are the hands. I said, no, they're not the hands. Okay, again. Oh, those are the hands. I said, no, they're not the hands. And then some children said, ah, oh, right, I see now. Those are the shoulder. That's, those are the shoulders. Yes, the shoulder joints. So I said, okay, then if, that, if those are the shoulder joints, oh, and that's the um, collarbone, essentially, what would these be then? And some children still say, the hands. But some other kids say, oh, no, it's not. Because if that's the shoulder joint, then that's got to be the elbow, I said, precisely. So if I then drew 
this line and this and then drew a dot there what would that be and again some children say the hands but others say no no if that's the shoulder that's the elbow that's the wrist exactly okay that's all right now do you say it looks different to this because this would suggest that the figure has no shoulders I then draw this here and again it confuses some people. ah those are the legs so I say all right so the figure's doing the splits then <laughs> oh no so that not not quite not quite I so what is it then what the, the, gotta be the legs so what if I did this now look at what we've got so far shoulders elbows wrists what do you think that might be some kids say yeah the hips I said that's right your pelvic bone right here the hips the pelvic bone so I, I, I then draw the, when I start drawing these lines now here by this time most of the class I've got the idea. One or two will still say, well, those are the feet. But by this time, most of us in the whole line, if the body's meant to be in proportion, then those legs would be very, very short legs, to lose the check, um, <laughs> it, it, uh, on, on this figure. So they then realize that this must be, uh, these uh, dots must represent some other joints, leg joints, yes, the knees. And then by the time I've drawn the rest of it, and drawn these here, these dots here, children say, oh, yeah, all those are the ankles. Exactly, all right. And then they, they then see the difference between the two. And straight away, it, I've sort of upgraded the, the, the stick figure. And many of the children found this extremely useful and didn't want to go back to this type of style. So, of course, because we're dealing with um, uh, figures in a comic, of course, you can have stick figures in a comic, but in most cases you have full figures. So I said this now actually helps you now to work out how you actually fill the body out because you've got everything in proportion. Another thing I tell them about proportions is that the human head is roughly one eighth of the length of the whole body, and that helps the artist then um, work out whether well to get the to get the figure in proportion so that the head is not too big or too small. The filling out, goes as such. And I actually start the picture off by drawing the shoulders and the arms. And because we, we're talking about comic figures, I give the, I make the body a, a bit muscular here. Now the challenge for many of the children is, so how do you then, what do you do with the rest of the body here? Now some children will literally draw the line close to the frame and draw it like this. So they'll, what they'll do is, for example, they fill out the body. Yeah. And then they'll go like that. So when they do that, they realize, oh on, no one's that thin. And then you have children talking about rib cages. They say exactly, if you feel here is a rib cage, which is roughly at the same level as your elbow. So right here, you got the rib cage. And start filling out the body to that line. Then from there, I'm sorry that I have to rush this. The knees, they know where to put the knees, and then they'll start, they'll start using terms like, and that's the calf, and that's the thigh, and we go into biology. Eat very quickly. Now, of course, here you've got to do the feet, hands. Again, sorry to have to rush, but you get the idea. That's roughly it, with a few modifications. And then you've got something that looks like a human body in proportion. Right, now, the next thing, of course, is if, we, if we're doing comics, if we're drawing comics and it's all about action, you can't have every single frame 
with a figure standing like this there's got to be movement so we've got to then draw uh, a stick figure that would in a in, in a position or in a in a way that would suggest movement so once the children have actually practiced this and i let them practice quite a lot and and i don't move on until they've completely rejected that and they're now working according to this principle we then go on yeah, to can i ask this? yes with um ellis lowry who was the you know, most famous yeah. of all english artists did he use this technique because he always think about him doing matchstick yes. men and women he probably did but i think if you look at his um figures close up they're more uh a this style than this style right, right. because the um if you think of larry really his the figure the figures were a central part but yet they were part of the whole as well because um we were just to look at the figures as a as a, a, a mass of people was looking at people um and it was a quick way of actually doing it as well yeah, yeah. you know um but oh, i have no doubt that larry could do this and would have done this but i think he, the message in his pictures was more to do with yes. the, the scene and the story of the scene as opposed to the people but um and it, it, what we want the children to be able to to do is to say if i want to draw it that way i can but i can also draw it this way as well so to suggest movement we're using the stick figures again but this time it's drawing the lines um, at an angle or certain angles to suggest movement so i i said to him right if we're going to move now to someone who's running how would that person look so i get the children to uh, to stand and to adopt a running pose and straight away as they adopt a running pose they're bending forward arms out knees bent to suggest that they're about to take off or they're in mid run so i said okay then so if we were then to draw using the principles of the the profile and the portrait and an egg shape yeah, that's the head that's the head to the side okay that central line of the stick man where would it be how would you draw it to suggest that someone's moving forward and straight away straight away you have a few children say well you draw it at an angle you draw it tilted i said precisely so we'll draw it tilted right there so straight away body's moving forward if that's the case then the pelvic bone also is going to tilt not the pelvic bone sorry i was testing this the the, the the collarbone collarbone sorry again i say to the children so what's that ah shoulders and the collarbone elbow and by this time now they're all saying you need elbow wrist good well done <laughs> okay now if the person's running to the side you don't necessarily have to draw the the the, the, the full pelvic bone from the front so i just draw a, a dot there to indicate the hip side of the hip knee ankle knee ankle okay and then it, again it's the same business of filling it, the shape out we'll just do a circle i think that suggests it's a, it's a fist again neck shoulders uh, uh, some kids are actually biceps forearm wrist fist rib cage here Okay, extremely difficult drawing from this angle but you get the idea the knees a bit extended there but you get the idea lines and shapes now if we're drawing action, uh, comics with action figures the figures don't only run especially superhero um, comics you have um, superheroes who can fly and 
Actually, in fact, I'll demonstrate it on this one. Again. This time, if the person's reaching to the sky like Superman, the angle for the collarbone would be the other way like this. Shoulder, elbow, wrist. Shoulder, elbow, wrist. And uh, probably the knee raised higher this time. And the other leg more extended that way. To get the idea? Shoulder, arm, fist, obviously taking more care with it, uh, I just did this recently with a group of um, uh, year one and year two children. How old are they? Uh, yes, they would be um, six and seven and the, the 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 outcome was actually amazing i asked them they drew these figures created their own superhero costumes so they they mm. colored in their own costumes being inspired by spider-man captain america superman so they had all these figures in front of them used features of their costumes adapted it to their own used the colors and other things put certain accessories on like boots gloves uh, capes and then they had their own photographs that were cut out and they cut their heads out mm. stuck on top and they became their own superheroes that's a bit like Usain Bolt isn't it the absolutely, fastest man in absolutely. the world and you see if you, you know Usain Bolt if you were going to uh, draw his uh, unique pose head body tilted you get it yeah uh, You got it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. You say bolt. Right, so the same principles of drawing a stick person standing up and running apply to a person sitting down. And we're going to, I'm just quickly going to draw now a picture of a figure sitting down from the side. So it's a profile view. Um, we have the head again, we call it uh, the egg shape tilted because obviously it's to the side I do, so I, I, I do this for the children to see if they've really got it now and they say oh the one some of them say well is that the foot sir is that the from the neck to the foot I said no it's not that let me do this for you and then one of the two children say, I'll get it now from the side that would be the shoulder so precisely so if that's the shoulder if I then do a diagonal line like that and put a dot there what would that be would that be the end of the hand by this hand now they get it because this would be just the hip so obviously the person sitting here now that would be the elbow that would be above if the person sitting down so therefore the rest of this line would be to draw the forearm to the wrists. I'll probably draw a slightly longer forearm but you get the idea. Then from the hip to the knee I draw a horizontal line and turn this way. It'll go there to the knee. So straight away now the children then now see that this person sitting down with their hands placed on their knee. Below the knee, of course, the shin to the ankle and then the feet. Okay. Probably shouldn't draw that a bit longer, but you get the idea. Now filling it in. Neck, back, hip, shoulder, arms, elbow to the wrist, to the hand placed on the knee, rib cage to the waist, and this person is very lean, they've done a lot of working out here, superhero, <laughs> um, top of the thigh, lower part of the thigh, I wouldn't be drawing two legs because remember 
you draw what you see. If you draw the figure from the side, you can only see one leg, one arm, and one side of the head. Calf, ankle, feet. And of course, the figure wouldn't be sitting in thin air, they'd be sitting on a chair. But this helps you to work out where the chair would be and the height of the back to the seat, edge of the seat, the legs. Seated figure. And then, in relation to filling out the face, you use yes. the same principles Same again. principles again, yeah. Uh, line one third of the way down, line one. Line two, two thirds of the way down. Line three, halfway between line two and where the chin would be. And using the principles that we use when drawing a profile. The line one is where the eye socket would be. You, draw, you can extend the line to line two where the nose would be, the proboscis. Bring it in slightly using your fingers to guide you. In slightly, out again to the mandible, which is the lips, and to the chin. Ears, I'll sit there. Eyes, there. Eyebrows, etc. And you fill it in accordingly. Wonderful. Okay, right. so that's been what about drawing a complex subject? Complex subject, yes. Well, you see, it's, it's good that we went through this process because it's going to be these principles and techniques that we're going to use now to draw the complex subject. Uh, this is a scaffolding right. of sorts. Yeah. Now, this fascinating picture here, Maurice, is what we're going to attempt today to draw using the principles. Perhaps you'd just like to spend two minutes just giving us the background as to yeah. this character. And, uh, this is, um, it's by um, a Victorian artist called um, Sir Frank Dixie. Um, and Dixie, like a lot of the Victorians, were very interested in the stories from um, uh, uh, South Asia, from the Arab world, from the Muslim world. And this, this is Lila. Um, uh, and the, the story is about Lila Majnun, it's one of the most famous stories in the Islamic world um, and it's about their, essentially their failed love affair but it's also um, uh, an allegory for the love of God it's, a, it's much more than just being the sensual woman um, I don't know where you can see this now but you can buy this online, I love it, it's That's a Frank beautiful. Dixie Lila Thank you, beautiful subject in more ways than one I'll get this closer here so straight away as I look at this complex image and it presents many challenges I'm remembering the key principles draw what you see look at line look at shape demystify deconstruct otherwise you'll be caught up with all the fascinating detail and the complex shapes that you can see within it break it down so straight away if I'm looking I'm looking at the face or the head, the angle of that central line that runs through the body, it's at an angle because she's reclining, so she's reclining it would be at an angle. The collarbone, the shoulder joints, the angle of the upper part of the arm to the elbow to the wrist. So that's what I see. Also the leg from the hip, which would be there, the, the pelvis or the end of the pelvis, uh, a nice diagonal line, strong line that goes to where the knee is and down, almost vertical, to the ankle. Another thing we'll be looking at as well is how all of these different points align. Can you see them? You can draw so many lines that break the figure up. that's how we look at it. So if I'm going to begin now to to follow that on paper as I said before and I, I, this is when I wish I was drawing with pencil and not with um, a marker because of course there's going to be too many lines they're going to get in the way but you've got 
You got the 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 got the face there. That line, that central line running through the body, I've got to make sure I, I draw it at an angle because that is going to guide the rest of my drawing for the figure. Because unless that line is is at a right angle, I it won't give the impression of a figure reclining. And that obviously is a figure reclining. Yeah. Shoulder. The joints there. The elbow is extended out there, so I've got to draw the elbow there. Back in again to the wrist, which is roughly there. Is that clear enough? Can you see that lovely? Now, our other elbow, the end of the upper arm, off through there. Now, what also helps me is an imaginary line in my mind, a horizontal line that, that shows where the level of the upper arm, where our arm bends is roughly along the same line of latitude, you could say, as the other arm there. And those help. So I've actually, I've got that in mind. It's roughly there. Okay. Another thing that I, I, I'm looking at also is this line, very strong line here, where her leg is raised, that angle. Now I've, I've not drawn it, I've not used this, I'm using a combination of her as a stick person as well as just literally looking at the shapes that I can see because when you get to this level of challenge you can incorporate all the different styles and use them accordingly uh, or where appropriate so that's what we've got now what I'm going to start doing now is, is looking more now at the uh, the shapes that I can see so as well as lines and angles the shapes so straight away the hair And I'm just looking at the shape. I'm not going to bother too much with the detail. The side of the neck. To the shoulder. And outwards. So can you see now how that guideline has helped me with when I'm filling out now where to actually place the, the, the end of the shoulder to the arm. Yeah. Now, so you follow this line, so it goes slightly behind the knee and continues. So it means then that the knee has got to come slightly above that line. Now, if you look at the two, can you see that line there? Can you see that how it corresponds to that line there? That's what I'm looking at lines. If I continue to look at it purely as lines and shapes, I won't be phased by the, the, the amount of detail that's actually in the picture. Now, at this point, and I've demonstrated this with children as well, very young children, they begin then now to see the correspondence between my line drawing and the actual picture. And I'll sometimes say, okay, then right, I want you to point to me now. Um, if I do this, Point to the picture where that is. Now I'm going to ask Morris here now, it's going to test your spatial awareness skills here. Lines and shapes. Sir, where would that be? That shape there. On the picture? Yeah. I think it would be here. See? Straight away. Well done. Yes. Now just by drawing the shape, just uh, if I doubt I'm going to draw uh, the edge of her, the, the neckline of her dress there. I would follow it down as so to there, roughly there, and use this line, the band around her waist, to help you as well. Here, to there. Okay. 
bearing in mind I've also got to look at the, the, the length of that space there and looking at mine already because you, you, you develop a very critical eye here I can see that my space is just a bit shorter than what should be there but um, as I go along I can alter that but I've got it roughly in the right position also the position of the hands positioning of the hands the top of the band is a line that meets to where her knuckles are so I've got to make sure now that when her knuckles are drawn which are here that that point there could you point to that Morris please just test your spatial awareness skills again you're talking about here mm, no so there lovely sorry it meets there you see where the challenge comes oh, in there for the children? Oh, sorry, right. I was a bit Into slow it. there. That's fine. And then we can start working it together. And there's another one. And that's roughly where, that's where the little finger comes. The, up to where the wrist is there. And of course there, there's the, there's the, uh, is it a, wristband or yeah some some under that yeah and you see for these for these quite complex pieces again I look at that line I look at that line I look at that line so there's a line that goes like that there's another one that goes like this and then there's another one that goes like that and you begin to make it up as it goes on shapes lines and shapes creases again Creases are, can be very, very confusing, but again, try to separate them as, uh, as individual lines. Now, of course, you've got the beads around the neck. Off there. I'll put dots in at the moment as my guidelines. Right. Oops. The arm of the chair or the, the sofa, if we just bring that down that way. Morris, do you know what I'm drawing now? What, what am I what am I trying to create here? You're you're trying to create Can you point to the picture? Yeah, sorry. I think you're you're what you're trying to do is to get almost that one. That one, here. So that no, follow the hand. Follow, sorry, you're up here. Follow the hand. Follow the line. Yeah. Now go off in that direction. Ah, what am I yeah. drawing? The, dre yeah. the dress. It's where she's yeah. sitting. So where she's sitting. It's where she's sitting. It's the edge of the. Yeah. Either where she's sitting or it's the edge of the um, of the material that drapes the. Um, yeah. 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 I know. I'm not seeing properly. No. So it's, that's what we're talking about. Ah. The artist's eye. Yeah. Yeah. What yeah. You see. Now, another thing that's helped me to work out how far this goes in is if I imagine a line going down like that the edge of that shape goes right through the center of the dress to the side of her head right yeah almost right now that means this head should be over there a bit more but it helps you be, to become very sort of critical of your own work but in a constructive way because you can then begin to to see where you went wrong and also put it right in fact obviously it was a pencil I could rub it out and shift the head over um, slightly to the uh, to the right but you, you can begin now to see yeah, the similarities it's the, it's the shapes yeah the shapes because shapes, essentially that's what it is it's just drawing shapes Wonderful. And there we are. Hands are all very difficult to draw, but again, just look at the lines. That's where the finger disappears behind the chair right okay this is like a master class right. can you remind us of the three principles of your golden thread three principles of the golden thread for me are oh, but yes it's it's drawing what you see and looking for lines 
and shapes essentially so it's his three principles but said in two sentences <laughs> <laughs> there all right what you've done and this has been this has been brill and um the the, found, the foundation is actually going to gift this to any mm. teacher that wants to use it um it's under what's called creative commons license which means you can use it but you can't sell it how many you, you've given us in half an hour or so yeah. how many lessons would you say and how long if you're if i'm an average teacher yeah. i've got no real drawing skills um art is a thing which sadly because of our ridiculous national curriculum um has suffered how long is it right. five lessons ten lessons? you you could um given that a lesson would be say an hour and a half right to have, a good three lessons could get you to this stage if, if properly um, organized and delivered. Right. Um, ideally, um, so the least would be about three lessons, um, six lessons, let's say, six lessons of an hour and a half each, we get you to that, where you, you know, you'd have quality. Yes. You know, you have quantity and quality. I rushed through today. Um, I've done this kind of work with uh, year five and year six pupils. Who um, are, what age, 10, 11? Uh, 10, 11. Yeah. And we've managed to get to, th uh, to understand the principles and apply them in a sort of basic sense um, over the course of a day. So oh, wow. starting at 9.30, yeah, finishing at yeah. 2.30. But you see, already you've done nearly six hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is just over three lessons of and, and the young people they stay with you they stay, stay on task they stay on task the they, they, they love it because the thing is once they've actually learned the technique and, and keep applying it their confidence grows right. so confidence leads to greater competence and they, they, they can't stop and all I do is just remind them well you know why I got that one because it, honestly yeah because I didn't look for yeah, the line the as shape I did or, here I wasn't yeah, looking I didn't really see. clearly enough and you know the old adage practice makes perfect yeah. the more you do it the better it will be obviously if I was doing this for my own pleasure I wouldn't be using um, a marker. No, no. I'm using a pencil. I take that much longer, obviously, to do it. You know, but uh, it just shows once you've got the principles in your head, you can execute a good piece of work in a relatively short space of time, and literally transform how um, or transform the students in how they see things and how they do things. Wonderful. And you're available for consultancy work if Absolutely. schools want to buy you in because I, yeah. uh, I mean, okay, I'm no longer a real teacher, um, but I would still feel a bit nervous. I mean, I'd do it, but to have you there. I do master classes with, with staff as well because it's important that they are confident yes, and yes. competent yeah. in it and therefore can pass it on to the children confidently that this is how it's done. And further to that, to be able to demonstrate it as well, yeah. uh, model it. Because often if I have a class for a day, I do what I call them, I, I ask them to, to draw first, so I want to know where, they, where yeah, they're at. Yeah. And that initial drawing is kept there as a reminder, because we're going to compare the oh, finished project at the end of the day, Before and and after. You, you see the progression yeah, yeah, throughout the day. Yeah. And I, I, do, I, I work through the process of demonstration, modelling, getting the children even to be part of it, then application, they right. apply the principles themselves to practice pieces and then we work on, a, on, a, on the final piece. So much of the morning is demonstration, demonstration, application, trial and error. Towards the end of the morning, start planning your final piece on a larger sheet of paper and then the afternoon now is the detail. There is another stage to this obviously, so it's the shading you know, the study of light and dark yes, uh, and yeah. looking at to how you create different tones, yes. the, the tricks of creating a smooth tone, a ruffle tone, a rough tone, things like that, uh, which are things that you add to this. Yes, yes. So you get a good repertoire of skills. Absolutely. And you can, you can differentiate it by outcome, one, but also differentiate it by task as well, because what I, what I might say to some students who I see have really uh, got the technique and have done extremely well. Right, I want you to try another piece here right. and I sort of increase the challenge and this time without any help from myself because by that time they'd have learned, they've uh, internalised the principles and the approaches. Master Brown, sir. sir? Pleasure. Really, well, really good. Um, as far as the foundation mm -hmm. is concerned, uh, it is about compassion. Part of our compassionate work is actually passing on the skills, and and I've seen Gill's own artwork, and you know, well, it, they're just wonderful stuff. So I hope you found that useful. If you want to contact us, you can all our uh, web and uh, uh, email addresses are on online. So thank you so much, and I wish you happy drawing.